Okay, so I'm a simple scientist doing stuff at IBM, trying to uh, enable uh, some of the future of computing. Okay. Okay, so, um, so what I'm going to do is um, sort of give you a flavor of what nano is all about. There's a lot of hype and I'm sure many of you have uh, heard of nanotechnology in various streams of uh, science and engineering. So uh, what I'm going to do is sort of play you um, a very interesting video on uh, uh, trying to motivate what these nanoscale phenomena is all about and how difficult or how challenging it is to make the future of uh, computing. So basically the future electronic devices that we're trying to make. So and then uh, once I talk about the phenomena, um, I will take you through some of the applications which you would typically hear and uh, maybe we will try to understand uh, how these devices actually function. Okay, so um, I don't know how to use this looks like, I'm technology challenged. So, um, so if you look at the evolution of a transistor, so um, my, my focus will be on electronic devices so I'll refer to the transistor. Uh, so if you look at the evolution of the transistor way back in the 1950s to what it is right now, um, the technology has undergone, uh, undergone a five orders of magnitude change in dimensions. So we used to make uh, transistors with feature sizes or uh, you know, uh, uh, electronic devices with feature sizes of a millimeter in dimension, right? And now we actually do uh, make devices in few tens of nanometers uh, regime. So in five, in five decades, we've actually undergone a five or orders of magnitude change in dimensions. And that's what has enabled um, uh, IT, that's what has enabled internet. That's because of this technology scaling. And uh, you know some of the uh, you know uh, inventions that have gone into making these ten technologies happen are the discovery of tunneling, and then um, also the invention of the STM. These are buzzwords for now. We'll just ignore them. Okay. Okay. So what's so interesting about nano, right? So all of us have seen materials typically in bulk because nanoscale, your eye can't actually perceive those uh, objects. Um, so. Does everybody recognize what this material is? This is very, you know, this is the uh, most precious material that an Indian would want to have in his house. Gold. Okay, excellent. Okay, so most of you would buy these for your girlfriends or your wives or, you know, your family. But then if I give you this kind of gold, then none of you would actually buy it, I think. I think your girlfriends wouldn't even take that as a gift. Turns out as you actually go um, scale the dimensions of a bulk material, so for example, if I take this gold and chop it into extremely small sizes, right, and bring it down to nanoscale, it turns out the optical properties of this material completely change. While in the bulk, you see that it emits yellow color, right, if I go into extremely small dimensions, it actually starts to emit very different colors. And the reason why this happens is that you know, there's a lot of something known as quantum scale um, effects where, um, you know, uh, 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 if you ever heard of band gap of materials, this continuously gets modulated as the dimension of materials change, right? So hence the emission property. So this is a visual example of what happens um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of optical properties of materials. So um, we'll play a quick video of how dramatically, uh, you know, properties of, for example, um, electrons, which are basically the tiny um, 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 matter that actually help, you know, make your devices function, hence your computers or whatever equipment. So can we play that media file? It's on the other side, in front of you, in front of you. Particles or little balls of matter. Can you play from the start? If we randomly shoot a small object. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, 
quickly see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So. They decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Can we go back to the... I, I, I didn't make this video, so, you know, save it for the person who actually made it. So uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this video is um, 
you know, we saw, we saw this visual effect of uh, the color that gold emits actually changes. Can we turn off this light? It actually annoys me. Um, um, so, uh, okay, so um, we saw this visual example and then in the electron case you actually see that, you know, electrons behave more like waves than particles in this extremely small scale, right? So because of these, um, um, uh, these weird things that happen to these electrons at this small scale, unfortunately it take me two hours of a lec uh, two hours lecture to actually explain uh, mathematically why this is happening. Um, so we're going to skip that, but you know, you have to trust me for now that the um, electrons behave both like, you know, uh, matter and uh, like particles and waves, okay? And let's see what happens to um, devices at, at small scale when such weird effects start coming into place. Um, so um, I'll skip this slide, okay? So all of us are very familiar with the transistor, right? So it's a three terminal device. You have a source, a drain, and then a gate. And what you're trying to do is control the current through this device by simply applying a gate voltage, right? That's how you control the resistance between a source and drain. And this is the fundamental device that goes into our, you know, computers. So what we did for the past five decades was to simply reduce the dimensions of this simple transistor. We reduced the length, the width, and also the thickness of every aspect of this transistor. But it turns out, um, it turns out we can't continue scaling um, due to some fundamental reasons. Um, the reason, so again, this is a three-dimensional picture of a transistor, right? So what we did was reduce the length, the thickness, and the width of this transistor. And that's how you would do an ideal scaling scenario. But um, it, and when you have an ideal scaling scenario, it leads to a higher density. For example, if I reduce the um, uh, length and width by a factor of alpha, I would get a density that scales up as alpha square, right? Uh, the number of transistors that I could have on a single chip. But now, uh, but it turns out there are some fundamental limitations that don't allow you to scale the uh, ideal way. And that's because of the thickness of the silicon dioxide, right? So that's the oxide material that separates the gate electrode from the channel. And that's down to about 12 angstroms. Can anyone take a guess on how, much, how many atoms 12 angstroms translates to? It's about, it's about um, uh, four molecules of silicon dioxide. That's how thin uh, the present day transistor uh, silicon dioxide thickness is, right? So because of this, you actually start to see, uh, and also combined with the fact that electrons start to behave as these waves, you start to get a lot of leakage current from gate into the, uh, into the channel, okay? So this leakage leads to unwanted um, uh, waste of power. So very rec uh, recently, we have come up with a technique where we have said, instead of orienting this source to drain along a particular crystal direction, you actually rotate the crystal axis. You can actually, the performance drops, but the power consumption actually um, uh, comes down by a factor of 10. So implication of this is uh, the following. If I give you a cell phone and say it operates at 5 gigahertz, versus 2.5 gigahertz, but I tell you that the 5 gigahertz one lasts for a day versus the other lasts for 10 days. I think it's pretty obvious what the choice would be, right? So you don't really care for so much of performance. You want more, uh, less of power consumption. And that's how uh, dramatic, um, you know, some of these um, important uh, nanoscale effects lead to in terms of coming up with new device techniques. Okay, so uh, in future, what you're going to see is the present day transistor, I think, will stop scaling at 22 nanometer technology node. Right now, you can buy chips off the shelf at 45 nanometers. So, for example, any computer chip that you have. Uh, but going further, this traditional transistor can't um, uh, scale with, due to the reasons I talked about, mainly dominated by leakage. So, um, the future of the transistor, which you would see on chip in the coming generations, both from IBM or an Intel or you know, companies that actually make chips, is a three-dimensional transistor, which no way resembles what you have here. It's here is a narrow uh, fin of silicon, and then on either side is the source and drain, and on top of that, you actually three-dimensionally fabricate a gate. And you do it uh, f f uh, because um, having a three-dimensional gate actually gives you a better control over the transistor in terms of reducing leakage, okay? Um, then another fundamental limitation of um, uh, devices is that um, imagine I get to a situation where I put a single atom transistor. That's between the source electrode and the drain electrode. I just have single atom of silicon sitting, right? So as you know, atoms have you know, discrete energy levels. We learned this in high school. 
the conduction also starts to get discretized. So typically in devices, what you would see is you know, current versus voltage, which is a straight line. Uh, curve now starts to get uh, a st uh, starts to show a step-like behavior. So one has to actually understand all these, um, you know, uh, properties of you know electrons at the small scale in order to predict this. Right? You can't just uh, continuously scale. Um, then another example of where nano is extremely important is um, our hard disk. It was actually um, uh, invented by one of my mentors, Stuart Parkin, who is an IBM fellow. Um, where you actually use a property known as spin of an electron. It's basically the magnetism arising out of you know, electrons. Electrons behave like tiny magnets, and it's the total number of electrons, for example, in a molecule or in a material that le leads to net magnetism. So uh, typically how your hard disk bit would work is you have two magnetic materials separated by a non-magnetic material. And um, if both the orientations of these um, uh, magnets are in the same direction, it's a low resistance state. While if they're in the opposite direction, it's a high resistance state. That's how you'd store 0 and 1. But it also turns out, as you start to make these devices smaller and smaller, magnetism starts to behave very weirdly. Non-magnetic materials become magnetic, and magnetic materials become non-magnetic. Again, I can't go into details of why it happens. Uh, for now, I'd be happy to tell you after this talk, but one has to really understand those properties at the small scale. I'm going to skip um, some of these slides. Uh, I'll go into energy. So um, another very important application where nano could possibly revolutionize our world is um, in solar cells, where uh, it turns out uh, when you go into this extremely small scale, the electron-electron, so-called electron-electron interactions become extremely strong. And that leads to a highly efficient solar cells. Okay? Uh, here's an example of, uh, this is going to come out in Times of India, our press uh, interview that was done uh, two or three days ago, coming up on Monday or Tuesday across India. Um, so where we have actually now uh, developed um, solar cells, and now, uh, I mean, uh, installed solar panels, and now we are able to connect these to you know, our high voltage DC and water cool systems. This leads to an energy efficiency of 10%. So typical data centers actually consume a few tens to hundreds of megawatts of power. And it turns out doing a solar integration leads to over 10% savings in the net power consumption. Um, so you'll see more of this kind of activities uh, going on in various companies. How many more minutes? Uh, can I take like five minutes? I know I'm out of time, but I was told I can take two more minutes. Okay. OK, so you know, again, in energy space, people make very efficient you know, lithium-ion batteries, uh, which can be you know, 10 or 50 times more efficient than what you have right now. Um, again, uh, in bio applications, people actually start making these nanoporous materials. And um, um, uh, the conduction through this nanopores can be, uh, can be used to sequence DNA. OK, so um, you know, you use it in sport, sporting goods because you can create really high tensile strength materials. Um, and again, in um, the energy industry, for example, catalysts, where you can make these catalysts extremely efficient by actually making these nano materials. 